to praise him. Listen, we're worshiping the Lord God of glory. Amen. So good to see you today. Uh, we had our service over the Magnolia campus. We're still out in the pavilion waiting for the final authorities from the fire department in Montgomery County to give us our occupancy permit. Got a few things we're working on over there, but uh, man, it was hot this morning until about right at the time the service started and then the wind started blowing. So the Lord was gracious to us. But uh, at least we got some nice wind provided by air conditioning in here, so it always makes it nice. Amen. So uh, praise the Lord for what you've got and uh, realize sometimes uh, when you're without it, you realize what you missed. Amen. <laughs> but uh, good morning to you. And it's, as I say, it's much cooler in here. Still got a summer crowd here. I'll be glad when summer's over and just got started, didn't it? So anyway, that's the way it works. But it is good to see you. We're continuing with the series of messages that we started last week having to do with worry. Now, this is not how to worry, okay? If you're looking for lessons, most of you don't need lessons on how to worry. Uh, the idea is that we don't want to worry. And it's not the old idea of don't worry, be happy. It's don't worry because Jesus said, don't worry. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. As we, as we got into the message last week, uh, we were talking about these first elements of it. But today we do have a brand new projector and brand new cameras in place. So uh, we're trying to work all the kinks and bugs out between projection and sermons and those things. So uh, we're all a bunch of rookies in training on all this new equipment. So be patient with us. Uh, we'll, we'll ask you to criticize us in four or five weeks down the road after we get past the bumps and humps, all right? So everybody say amen. amen. Everybody's not going to criticize anyway, say amen. The rest of you, just never mind. <laughs> Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 6. This is where we were reading from last week. It's a Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about these specific issues about worry and what it meant to worry and not worry. Amen? So in Matthew chapter 6, let's stand so we honor the reading of the Word this morning. In verse 24, and we're going to read through verse 34. If you have your Bible open, you can read along with us. And we also will have these words available on the screen. No one can serve two masters for either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. For this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious for your life or what you shall eat or what you shall drink or for your body as to what you shall put on it. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubic to your lifespan? And which of you, uh, and, and why are you anxious about your clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, they do not spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so raised the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into, into the furnace, will not much more do so for you? O oh, men of little faith, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Well, what shall we clothe ourselves? For these things, things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, they'll be added to you. Therefore, third time he says it in this little treatise here, don't be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You may be seated. And may God bless the reading of this word today. Three times in this passage, Jesus said, don't worry. Don't be stressed. Don't be anxious. Don't fret. And then he gives following excellent reasons why that it should not happen. One reason it's not stated here, it's absolutely a waste of your energy and a worthless, useless exercise of your time, mentally, physically, emotionally. One of the most quoted preachers in America was an evangelist by the name of Vance Havner. You may not know him well, but every preacher in America pretty much knows who he is and every evangelist. Vance Havner said this about worry. He says, you know, worry's like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do but it won't get you anywhere. It'll give you something to do, but it's not going to get you anywhere. That's pretty much the, the truth of the, of the matter here. Last week I gave you four things about worry and why, why we shouldn't worry, but the heart of the message is pretty much don't worry. Don't even worry about the necessities of what you're going to eat, how you're going to be housed, how you're going to be clothed. Don't worry. Don't worry. 
don't worry. <laughs> so it makes it real clear that no matter what it is you're worried about, you shouldn't worry. Last week, we started the message. We dealt with two, two parts of this, and we talked about how useless it is to worry and what a real waste of time that it can't be. One, it's unfaithful because of our master. Two, we said, it's unnecessary because of our heavenly father. The two points that I'll cover today are these points. One, it's unreasonable because of our faith. And the fourth will be, it's unwise because of our future. You know, and who holds our future? Now, let me get back to this was last week's part of this on part one, which talks about we don't worry, one, because it's, it's unfaithful to our master. The Lord Jesus, remember, tells us very clearly that all this worrying is, is in contrast to the fact that we have a master, our heavenly father. He starts it out by saying, for this reason, you don't worry, what reason? You, the reason is because you don't serve mammon, you don't serve the world, you don't serve yourself, you serve God. Because you serve God, hey, what's your worry? Because God owns everything, he controls everything, and he provides everything. Now, if you weren't here last Sunday, that was pretty much the first half of last Sunday's message. We talked about the sovereignty of God and God's ability to meet your need no matter what your need might be. That's why the Bible makes it clear on multiple occasions from Genesis to Revelation. Listen, nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. You say, well, what about, listen, what about doesn't have anything to do with it. God is bigger than all the whatabouts that we can ever present to him. And we also said the second thing is unnecessary because of our father. Will he not also provide for you? And catch this phrase, oh, men of little faith. You see, it, it, it's a rebuke here to us that if we're worrying instead of believing, if we're worrying instead of trusting, if we're worrying instead of embracing God's word and his promise to us, that just shows how little faith that we, that we have how little trust that we have in the Lord. And so the contrast here is instead of worry, believe. Instead of worry, instead of doubt, trust. Instead of stress, put your trust, your faith before the Lord and embrace the Lord on whatever you're facing and turn it over to the Lord. But all too often we do just the opposite. We spend our, our time and, our, and most of it worrying. And we say it's, it's worry is really unreasonable because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, the point. I want to go beyond just the fact that we have, that I'm believing God and trusting God. You know, the rest of the world, and, and he uses the terminology here about the Gentiles. He says, why, do you, why, do you, why are you being anxious for all these things the Gentiles, you know, they eagerly seek? In other words, we went back to this paragraph before, verse before, God's our Father. We don't serve the world. On the other hand, he says, unless you're like the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles here, he's talking about the unbelieving cultures and the unbelieving nations. Oh, they had gods, and they had religion, and they had graven images. They had idols. They had all these things. But, you know, the only reason that they had those things was kind of, you know, hopefully escape some of the other problems that they were having in their life. But they still eagerly pursued all these things as well as their pagan gods and their pagan cultures and their pagan religions. Things haven't changed that much today. We're not bowing down to graven images in our culture. Yeah, it's like Billy Graham said, you know, the idols of today are the ones that we have engraven in our mind. And what does that mean? We have our own philosophies now. A philosophy of life that says, you know, you should, you should be happy. A philosophy of life says you, you'll be happy if you look a certain way. This philosophy of life says you can be happy if you have more stuff, if you have more money. You can be happy if you drive this kind of car. You can be happy if you live in this particular neighborhood, all right? If that's, then if you have all these things lined up, he says, he says, that's like lost people. That's the reference, basically. People who don't know God. You have a faith, and your faith declares that Jesus is Lord and that he owns everything, controls everything, and provides everything. Your faith is, includes all of that. He says, so why would you worry? You're not like a lost culture. You're, you're not like a pagan people. You, your life is it's completely different than, than everybody else's life. So why should you worry about your clothing? Why should you worry about what you're going to eat? Why should you be concerned about trying to add more days to your life? God's in charge of all this. It's, it's not your department. Let me put it this way. Maybe this, this vernacular will help you understand it. It's above your pay grade. <laughs> it's not your responsibility. What's your responsibility? Well, he tells us in just a moment, but we understand very clearly here, because I believe God, because I trust God, and because I realize that I have a heavenly God, this father of mine who loves me, I don't have to worry. If I don't know God, the reference being the Gentiles here, then I have a lot to worry about. It doesn't take a real long look around us and see what's happening in the world around us to not get worried real fast. 
I mean, the, the, the whole culture around us is so, is, is so filled with tension and so, filled with so, so much turmoil in our world today. There's no peace. And, and the only hope of peace that people have seems to be in getting more money or having more things or, or, or escaping through some bottle or pill or whatever it might be. But real peace comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you don't know him, then where do you have to go? And that pagan culture Jesus was talking about, there were all kinds of gods, but they weren't gods, all right? There were, there were gods of fear, gods of dread, you know, and they had to appease these gods, and they usually demanded much and promised little or, and absolutely provided nothing to those who worship them. But that popular philosophy, even though we don't stand before the idols, feels popular. We just, you know, it's, it's this idea of let us eat and drink. Let's be merry for tomorrow we die. <laughs> that, that's pretty much, let's, let's, let's grab for the gusto. Let's live every little bit of life that we can live right now because there's nothing after that. But for the Christian, we don't live by this worldly mindset. We don't embrace that philosophy of just get all you can, can all you get, you know. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't live that kind of, that, Jesus is basically saying, for you to live your life like that and be worried about all those things is to be like this Gentile, which basically tells us this is what it means to be uh, <clears throat> worldly minded. If you're worldly minded, if that's where your mind is set on, the things of the world, don't expect any satisfaction. Don't expect any uh, any comfort from that, because the world's not going to comfort you on any level on any of those things. It's just not going to happen. But on the other hand, if you seek God and you seek his will and you seek his purpose and you seek his grace and you understand his mercy, then God, then you have something you can look forward to. The faithful, trusting, obedient child of God is not going to look to the world to satisfy its problems. It's going to look to its heavenly Father. So he says, don't be anxious for these things. Paul writes it later. and He says, don't be anxious for these things, but in everything, make it by prayer and supplication letting you know, and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. What's he saying? You don't have to worry about this stuff. You don't have to freak out about the things. Why don't you take the things that you're concerned with or that you're worried about, take those particular things, and you turn those over to your heavenly Father. You let your requests be made known to God. You let, your, you, you let your worries, your fears, the anxieties, just state them up to your heavenly Father and then begin to give thanksgiving. What is that about? I, I got a problem here. You want me to be, hey, your thanksgiving is the evidence that you're really trusting God and that you're really believing God. All right, the absence of your thanksgiving, the attitude of thanksgiving is basically saying, I'd rather worry about it. <laughs> I'm not going to really trust the Lord with it. And like I said before, are we praying on our knees or are we just worrying on our knees? The, the cause of worry, Jesus is really getting to the bottom line. The cause of worry is because you're seeking the things of this world. And you're thinking that contentment with things is going to satisfy. But there's no contentment to be found in things. It's never going to satisfy. Your contentment is going to be found in your heavenly Father. Again, that's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be conformed to the world. The Apostle John says, because all that is in this world is not of the Father. It's not this world that's going to satisfy you. It's not getting more stuff in this world that's going to satisfy you. What's going to satisfy you is the grace and the power and the glory of God. So we, tr we don't want to trust the Lord. Why? Because worry is pretty much a, a characteristic of unbelief. George Mueller put it this way, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning and the beginning of true faith will be the end of anxiety. Can you catch that for a moment? Say, Brother Joe, I've got problems, and I've got stresses, and i got these anxiety, and it just causes more stress and more anxiety. Hey, how are you going to deal with that? I'm going to believe God. God has made solemn promises to me, promises that are sealed by the very blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. And God is telling me, I can take all those things to him and present them to him and find the end of my anxiety if I'm willing to trust him with those things and believe him with those things. But if not, listen, what is so characteristic of that? All this worry and all this fear. And again, that's the way the Gentiles live their life. 
That's the people. That's the multitude that ultimately don't believe God. And the plural form of that, as you find it here, is usually referred to non-Jews. In the context of where we're at today, it's just by extension, any unbeliever. Unbelievers, it's natural to worry. Unbelievers, it's natural to live in fear. Unbeliever, it's natural to be anxious about tomorrow and worry how, how your life is going to work out. But it's not the norm, is what Jesus is teaching us, if you're a child of God, for you to live your life that way. Why? Because you don't serve the world. You serve God, and you love God. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to make my choice. Am I going to be spiritually minded, which is life and peace, the Bible says in Romans, or am I going to be worldly minded, which is pain, <laughs> death, anxiety, misery, and always leads to more fear? Now, catch this. Jesus is obviously rebuking the children of God for living in anxiety. But with that, with that rebuke, with that negative word, also comes a very positive word in the form of a command. But it's a command that's a promise at the same time. And he says, but instead of that, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Instead of worrying thing, about things, Seek God, his kingdom first, and his righteousness. Instead of living fearful lives, instead of that, the option is simple. Seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Instead of being fearful about tomorrow and what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen tomorrow, and what if this happens, and what if the stock market crashes, and what if my, what if my 401 fails and my IRA collapses, and what if I'm left as an old person without any real income and I've got to live off that meagerly crumbs that the government throws at me? <laughs> the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars I gave them. What about that? He says, no worry. You seek me first to my kingdom, my righteousness, and I will take care of you. What a glorious promise. Now, all too often in the, in the culture that we live in, always got lights burning out around here. All too often in the culture that we live in, you know, we're, we're surrounded with all these things that seem to press in on us and, and put us in a, in, a, in, a, in a state of fear and a state of worry and a state of doubt. It's, it's like every day we're being pushed into a mold. And that's, that's exactly what Paul was making reference to in Romans 12. He says, you can be conformed. What happens with this point? Pressure seeks to shape us and seeks to form us. Or we can be transformed. Trans is something about carrying us out of something, carrying us over something, carrying us away. To take, in other words, God will take us out of this situation and do something about shaping our lives according to his righteous will and purpose for our life, or we can let all these stresses and all these fears seem to push us into the mold that the world has. The cause of worry, I think for the believers, simply this. The cause of worry for the believers, and when we end up seeking the things of the world and thinking that contentment will come by getting the things of the world instead of seeking our contentment in Jesus Christ. We just think, if I just had this thing, if I just had more of this, if I had longer days, then everything would be better. And what happens? We miss God. We miss his grace. We miss his glory. We miss, his, we miss the wonder of the Christian life. And we end up just living our lives like everybody else in the world. What does it mean to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness? Well, if you look at the particular word when he talks about his kingdom here, it does not refer to a geographical country, a place. Well, there's the kingdom of, of Britain, and there's the kingdom of China, and there's the kingdom of America. But it's a word which has to do more with rule, all right? His dominion over all things. So, the kingdom of God, Paul wrote the church, says the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, all right? Where we are is where the kingdom of God is. Where God's rule is is where the kingdom of God is. Where God is ruling is where the kingdom of God is, all right? We know that much of this world kingdom is dominated by Satan and the forces of hell. But here we are in the midst of the darkness as shining lights in the kingdom of God. I love the way the apostle wrote, he says, it is righteousness, it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let me say it one more time. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. Where are you in your Christian walk of life? 
Are you in the kingdom? Well, Brother Joe, Jesus is my Lord. Then you're in the kingdom, but you need to let the kingdom rule and the dominion of God be over your life. And as you do that, by putting all these things in his hands and say, I trust God with these things, then you can begin to experience the peace of God and the joy of the Lord that's in the Holy Spirit. But we don't experience peace nor joy because we're too worried about how we're going to pay the stinking gas bill. Can I get an amen? <laughs> God said, I will take care of you. I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to watch over you. I am your heavenly father. Paul wrote the church when he said this, do you not think that God who gave his only son for you will not also provide for you everything that you need in his life? Whatever that might be, Whatever your needs, genuine needs are, God says, I will meet those needs. I'm going to take care of you. And when we do truly say, I believe that, and God starts doing something, you're very unique in our midst and in our presence. Let me give you what I think it really means to seek the kingdom of God is. I think seeking the kingdom of God is when we're just willing to lose ourselves in the presence of God. All right? Go back to that. When we really just realize that my life is really about serving the Lord, and being what God wants me to be, and being who God wants me to be, it's like, it's like it says in the book of Acts, where he says, I do not consider my life to be any account or even dear to myself. That's seeking the kingdom of God. I'm not worried about my life. I'm not worried about adding to my account here. He says, I just want to finish the course. I don't fulfill the ministry that God has given me to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. What's he saying here? Listen, what's really important is not my life, it's the life of Christ. And I'm not here to show the life of Joe Arms. I'm here to show the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not here to show you my talent, my wit, my personality. We want people to see Jesus in us. We want people to experience the life of Christ through us, as seen through our lives. That's the kingdom of God. But not only is it, as I say, I just want to love God so much that I obey God, all right? Because my obedience should usher out of my love for God, right? So I'm, what does it mean to seek, him, seek his kingdom? I'm going to love God. But not only that, do I love God. I mean to seek, I believe it means to seek his kingdom, that we're trying to extend that kingdom by winning as many people to Jesus Christ as we possibly can. Because every time someone comes to Christ, the rule, the dominion of God is extended more around us. The more people that come to Christ, the more the kingdom of God begins to grow. Our responsibility is to be a part of sowing the gospel into the field, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, telling the people that we come in contact with, that we associate with, that we live around, that there is a salvation that's available through the grace of Jesus Christ, that he has paid the price for their sins, and they can come and have eternal life. And as they receive that life, the kingdom of God is being manifest, and the kingdom of God is being multiplied. You want to build the kingdom? You want to multiply the kingdom? And I would say the very best thing that you can do is to win people to Jesus Christ. Seek first the kingdom. But also, I believe that seeking the first the kingdom of God is when we just yearn to see that full expression of the millennial glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, right now, Jesus has left us in charge here, right? To be, what, to be what he is through our lives, we manifest his life to the world around us. But we know, as we study the scripture, there is a day coming when this age is going to be closed up and wrapped up, and a new day will begin, and that day will last for a thousand years. And during that thousand years, we will be living in our eternal glorified bodies as Christians. But not only will we be doing that, We'll be here on the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ, who will reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords on the planet. We should be yearning for that day when the world will know peace like it's never known since before the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. That once again, there will be a, a great grace of God that is manifest. There'll be no more wars, all right? That the lion will lay down with the lamb. It's going to be a supernatural time of the sovereignty of God where the whole world sees what the world would be like when Jesus is in control. But that doesn't end at all. After that thousand year ends, we should be yearning for that eternal, glorious, heavenly kingdom. We'll all reign with God the Father throughout, throughout the ages in our eternal state in heaven. There should be a hunger for that. 
We ought to talk like ha about heaven like we're homesick. Amen. We ought not be so sad when folks do graduate and get to heaven. Amen. Maybe we'd be mad they got there before us. That be, would be a proper maybe. But the kingdom of God, there's so much promise in the word of God for your life. Not only abundant life now, but man, the full, glorious life of the Christian and the child of God. What a day is coming. What a glorious time is coming. Listen, it's not... It's not an easy world that we're living in, but we cannot be consumed by this world around us. We should be consumed by the kingdom of God, but not only that seeking God and his kingdom, but we're also realizing he says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That right standing with God, that right relationship with God. What does that mean really? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is righteous, all right, that he's right. There's nothing impure about him. There's nothing, there's nothing off with him. He's completely, perfectly related to the Heavenly Father, and he stands in complete and full righteousness. There's no sin in him, all right? Now, for us, righteousness starts, first of all, when we give our life to Jesus Christ. We are made righteous so that we can fellowship with God because there's no unrighteousness that's fellowshipping with God, all right? So God makes us fellowshipable, all right? He gets us in a place where we can relate to him. He doesn't need to be changed. We have to be changed. But the Bible says if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. What happens? We get the righteousness of God. That's what we call positional righteousness, all right? We're positionally right with God. But then there's practical righteousness. Practical righteousness means that I'm growing in grace. I'm becoming more like Christ. Yes, I've been blessed with his righteousness, but now I'm learning what it means to talk right, act right, live right, love right, be right, so that Jesus Christ is truly manifested in my actions. Amen. The righteousness of God is being seen through me. So I believe to seek his righteousness means that we should be growing in grace. We should be, we should be, we should be maturing in our walk with God. And if we're growing in his kingdom and growing in his righteousness, man, the world sees Christ. But there's, these, there's this element that seems to be absent in so many people's lives is one is that progressing on and growing on and learning and being teachable and realizing none of us have reached the end line yet. We all need to grow. All right. And catch this. We're not all at the same place. Some are a little farther down the road in their maturity than others are. Some are less, some are more. But in the midst of that, if we're practicing righteousness in our life, we're loving each other, no matter where we're at. And we realize that I'm not your master. You're not my master. It's not my responsibility to sit around and criticize you, nor your responsibility to sit around and criticize me. Amen? Our responsibility is to pray for one another, encourage one another, while it is still day. We're pushing each other a little bit with grace and love down the road. We're walking together in fellowship. Everybody in this room has faults and marks and scars and some mess somewhere, amen? But, it's, you know, it, it's amazing how that we can just get so arrogant and so proud and so filled with pride that we've sat around and started saying, well, she's not what she ought to be and he's not what he ought to be. And bless God, you know, I hope I'm never like that. You know, what a mess we end up with. It shows how unrighteous we really are. So in righteousness, we encourage. In righteousness, we share. In righteousness, we love. And catch this. In righteousness, we serve God. We're all serving God. We're soul winning. We're serving each other. We're finding our place in the body of Christ. We're being what God's called us to be. So that's what we're doing instead of what? Worrying. <laughs> now, I can guarantee you, if you're worrying, you're not doing these other things. You're not serving. You're not pursuing. You're not growing. You're not maturing. Amen? We're completely headed in the wrong direction at that particular point in our life. Last point is this, worry is unwise because of our future. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. It's going to take care of itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. Can I get one amen? amen. <laughs> Every day has more than enough trouble for its own, it seems to me. It seems like some days I can come up with enough trouble for two or three days worth. Amen? But he said, hey, everybody's going to have troubles. But you don't worry about them today or tomorrow. And you don't worry today about those troubles tomorrow. God, God will give you grace for this day, right? 
God will give you the, in fact, God will give you grace for tomorrow, but he won't give it to you till tomorrow. All right. When you get to tomorrow, there's grace that's sufficient for that day. But how's it going to help you to go to bed tonight worrying about tomorrow? But how many people do that? I'll, I'll raise my hand. I'm guilty on many occasions of doing that. Until I realize how silly I'm being and start turning it into prayer. And start presenting it to the Lord. And start not only letting my request be known, but also begin just to have an attitude of faith where I start giving God thanks by submitting these things to him and letting him rule in my heart and my life. It's amazing what God can do and will do when we just simply start believing him. But hey, any other, any other way, it's just a waste of your life. God is the God of tomorrow. He's the God of all time. He's the God of eternity. And, I, and, and Lamentation says, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases and his compassions, they never fail. They are new every morning. What is new? God's loving kindness. God's loving kindness is new every morning. His compassions, they're new every morning. You know, I got fresh new compassion for today. Fresh new loving kindness for today. I had what I needed yesterday. Praise God, if it went stale, I got some fresh new compassion today. All right. That's, I'll meet you tomorrow when you get to tomorrow. I'll take care of you tomorrow when you get to tomorrow. But while we're living in this baby boomer age, you know, where so many people are getting older, and as they get older, they begin to even worry more and more about tomorrow. How will I be sustained? And how will my needs be met? And what if Medicare fails? And what if Social Security collapses? Hey, all that can happen. We don't have to worry. All that stuff can go on, but we don't have to fear. Why? God promised me that he would take care of me. How about you? Did he make that promise to you or is it just me? No, he made that promise to each and every one of us. What if my health begins to fail? He's going to take care of you. But what about, listen, he's going to take care of any what about? Because there'll be grace and compassion and mercy to meet that need when that need comes. You got to love Isaiah when he writes this, the steadfast of mind, thou, speaking of the Lord, the steadfast of mind God will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. In other words, what does that mean, this everlasting? It means I'll have a place to stand. And I'll have a place to stand that is sure, that's not slippery. I have a place to stand when everything else is falling around me. When everything else goes under, I'm on the rock. I'm okay. Because why? Because my Father takes care of me. But what do I need? I need to realize the importance of a steadfast mind here. What is that steadfast? It is steadfastly set on things above and not on things below. It is steadfastly set on, the, on the, the sovereignty of God. It is steadfastly set on trusting God. It is steadfastly placing itself in the hands of God. And he's going to take care of me. So I can trust him. In fact, he's not going to fail. He's an everlasting rock. So I can have an everlasting trust. Amen. And I can trust him forever because he is trustworthy. But that's really what the whole text really gets back to. You, since you serve God and not man, then you're going to be all right. So you don't have to worry. Doesn't mean we don't have concerns. Doesn't mean we don't commit ourselves to work, commit ourselves to, 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 to what God's called us to do in, in this life that we're living in, commit ourselves to the will of God and to the work of God. But we don't worry. We don't worry. What do we do? We pray. We trust. We hold on to the promises of God. And we give God, at that point, a platform in which he begins to work. It's, it's, it's preparing the day for him to do in it as he desires to do. So don't worry. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. Don't worry. Well, what do you want me to do? Trust God. Put your mind steadfastly on him. But isn't that where the battle really goes on in our hearts and our minds every day? How many of us begin today and all of a sudden Satan begins to bring stuff into our thought life and the processes of our thinking that are contrary to God's will and contrary to God's ways and contrary to God's purposes for our life. And we just start taking that in and start deliberating and debating with the devil in our heart and our mind instead of saying, Lord, you know, my mind does not belong to the devil. It doesn't belong to the world. It belongs to you. And so I'm setting my mind on things above today where you reign and I'm setting my heart on you and the things.
God today are going to be the things that appear, the things that are of a good report, the things that are righteous, and the things that are lovely, and the things that will glorify you, and the things that will express my trust and my faith that you're going to carry me through no matter what I have to go through. Plenty of trouble in each day. There's no promise there won't be difficulties, but sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. I got plenty of temptation I'm going to deal with today. I got plenty of difficult situations I'll walk through. I may meet some difficult people today. Amen? But I can believe God through all of it. And I don't have to go to bed at night with regrets and fears and doubts and worries. Don't worry. Let me say it again. Don't worry. Believe. Trust God. Let's stand with our heads back. Father, we come to you and thank you for your mercies because they are new every morning. Your compassions, never, they never fail. They never cease. As we come to this place today, help us to understand that if we belong to you, that you're committed to us to take care of us, to meet us here, to feed us, to clothe us, to shelter us. Help us to understand. But more than just to understand, Lord, to come to the place of obedient faith and trust in you. Our heart's desire is to seek you, your kingdom, and your righteousness. Well, they heads bowed just for a moment. Should you not know the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning, you have plenty of reasons to worry. You should be worried about what's going to happen today, tomorrow, and the next day. Most of all, you should be worried what happens in eternity. But there's a better way than worrying. Why don't you come to Christ? Why don't you cast your cares upon him? He cares for you, the scripture tells us. Why don't you give your life and your heart to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? In this altar today, there's several men here. Anyone who's be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus Christ personally, in a real way, in your life. And you don't have to have these things of fear, doubt, and worry prevail over your life. You can be free. If you want to know Christ, I encourage you to come to any one of us. There are those in this room this morning who've been letting some of these things get up under your skin far too deep. You need to come to the place of putting all that on the altar today with the Lord. And I want to encourage you during this time of invitation, this time of prayer, it will extend in just a moment that you will come find a place in the altar and between you and your heavenly Father, who's already proven his love to you, that you'll get these things in his hands again and turn them over to him. If you've been, if you've been living outside God's will in your life, that only opens the door to greater fears, greater doubts, and greater worries. If there's something in your life that God's been speaking to you about today, I want to encourage you on this day to get your heart and your life right with Jesus Christ. Maybe come to either pray with one of us or find a place in the altar somewhere between you and the Lord Jesus to get it right today. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You've been praying. You believe for God's leading you. Why don't you come and let one of us know today? I want to be a part of Believer's Fellowship. Maybe you just need someone to pray with you, pray for you whatever the need is. We extend this invitation. Don't. Don't hold back. Let God take control. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Would you come today in Jesus' name and be received? Let God do what he desires to do in your life. Would you come? We worship as we sing this song. Step out. Let's trust the Lord today. Come. Are you hurting and broken the weight of your sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. i
you today and we thank you that you are a compassionate gracious and faithful heavenly father to us that there's no need in our life there's no issue that we face that you're not present that you're not aware of and that you don't stand ready to meet us we thank you for your nearness lord we thank you for your goodness and i pray lord I pray for each and every one of us in this room who would tend to give in and give way to fear, to worries, which torment us on every side. I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you would make yourself known in each of those moments to show us how adequate, how able, and how near you are to meet the need. Guide us to your cross. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. You know, I, I thank God continually for the beautiful grace that he continues to offer our life. When I preach these sermons, I'm always preaching them to myself as well, in case you ever wondered that. If you wonder where I get my subject matter, I usually start with my heart, all right? Obviously seeking God's will and grace and wisdom and all things for our church, but many times, you know, I've been pouring over these areas and issues that I face in my own life and we deal with in, our, in the reality of everyday life. I would like to tell you that your pastor is perfect and never worries about anything, but that would be an absolute lie. All right. And I've made a promise a long time ago, never lie in this pulpit. So uh, shouldn't lie anywhere, but obviously the pulpit, amen. But uh, we all face these things, but I just wanted this to be an encouragement, a rebuke if necessary, but like Jesus said, it's an encouragement and it's a command with a promise. You know, don't worry but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it's kind of like God says, I'll take care of the rest. I got you. I got you covered. And praise God for that. Amen. Brother Gay, would you come? We got some closing announcements. Amen. Don't forget your tithes and your offerings on honor of the Lord with uh, your first as he uh, blesses you, bless others. 
Uh, also, if you are not receiving the prayer request or weekly e-blast, uh, and you would like to be a part of those lists, there are forms outside for you to go ahead and fill out, place it in the offering receptacle, and uh, make sure that you get on those uh, each of those distri distribution lists. Uh, again, going back to our ties and offering, we don't pass a plate. We have off offering receptacles in the back, uh, and you can show that worship to God by placing your ties and offering in those receptacles. Also, don't miss Wednesday night. If you are, oh, sorry, meet your giving statements are available in the lobby. If you didn't pick yours up last week, be sure to go back there and pick it up. If you have any questions or you feel like anything's an error, please see, please call the church. Uh, Wednesday night, if you're not coming on Wednesday night, you're missing a great time of fellowship. And also, so we're going to add something new this week. Uh, we're going to have, we're going to be going over the three Ps, Peter, pizza, and prayer. So the first 15 minutes, we're going to have fellowship, but more importantly, we're going to start praying. We're going to have a 15-minute prayer meeting because it's important that we pray for each other. We have a lot of hurting people in our body, amen? We have a lot of people that are in our hospital, a lot of people that are hurting, and we need to lift them up because that's what we're called to do, amen? But we, more importantly, we need to pray for our leaders of our nations so that we can move forward as a great country, amen? So. Don't forget also, next slide, please. Uh, get plugged in. Uh, I, need, I don't need volunteers. I need people that are going to commit. Amen? That's what I need. I need commitment because volunteers come and go. I need people that are going to commit to our children, to our youth, to areas of our church. Uh, and, and you can start on July 28th. We have a fundraiser. Steve uh, Hutchins, we're doing a fundraiser for him, and we're going to pre-sell. Uh, briskets next week, so be sure to bring your checkbooks or cash. Uh, next week, we're going to be selling, pre-ordering, or pre-selling briskets, half and full. Uh, but more important, we need somebody to, we need a group of men or women, either one, uh, to tear down and, and, and clean up afterward. Because we're anticipating God to, to move in a mighty way. But we also have to be ready for Sunday. And so we need people, if you can't be here all day, we need you starting around 1 2 o'clock just to help clean up. Because if there's a lot of us, it won't take that much time. But if there's only two of us, it's going to take us all day. So we need your help. Amen. Food pantry. Again, share those carbs. We've got lots of breads in, in, bread in the kitchen. Uh, if you have neighbors or friends or somebody in the street that needs a loaf of bread, we have it for you. Amen. Also, snacks and pastries and things like that. Joel Gutierrez is going to be in the back if, if you want to commit to uh, help out on the 28th. So please see Joel. Again, he's the one that's kind of, spirit, kind of taking the point today just to get your name. He's not taking it over. He's just getting your name down so that we can get you committed to help clean up on the 28th. Amen? Any other? I think that's all we have. Again, welcome to our first-time visitors. Our pastor would like to meet you in the back at the Welcome Center. Please complete that connection card, and we'll get you some information about our church. Uh, we do have Lift Kids and Youth Meeting tonight at 6. Uh, we'll see you this evening or on Wednesday. Amen. You are dismissed.